Welcome to the Purely Podcast. I'm your host, Alicia Pope, health coach, wellness expert. You can consider me your online bestie too. Imagine we're having a green juice together or a glass of wine for that matter. I believe in wellness that empowers you and lifts you up. On this podcast, you can expect a 360 degree view of wellness. But remember, there's no perfect when it comes to our health. It's whatever works for us. With that, let's dive in. Enjoy. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Purely Podcast. I am so excited for today's episode because this is the first episode where we are chatting about financial wellness, and it's something that I think is so important to chat about because for so long, it's an area that I kind of ignored. And luckily Nick helped me learn so much. I have to give him a shout out when it comes to financial wellness. But I think that with a lot of women, because I've seen amongst a lot of people that I know with my friends and things like that, there isn't as much financial literacy. And the thing is, as a health coach, we always look at this thing that I've called the circle of life. And we look at all the different pieces of the pie when we're looking at your overall health and wellness. And one of those areas is financial wellness because it does play such a big piece in our overall health. Financial wellness and financial stress, financial stress can cause high levels of, you know, physical symptoms like sleep loss and anxiety and headaches, migraines, compromised immune system, digestive issues, you know, goes chronic stress. So it's definitely something that we need to look at when we're looking at our overall wellness. And it's obviously Obviously a very holistic route of looking at it. So today we are learning all about financial wellness and why it's so important and getting some education from Danny Pascarella, who is a certified financial planner and earned a bachelor of arts and a master's of arts in international business from the university of Florida, as well as a master's in journalism from Columbia university. She previously worked on wall street where she managed money for ultra high net worth individuals with at least 25 million in investable assets. While working on Wall Street, Danny became painfully aware of the wealth gap in America and left to democratize financial education in our country by launching 111. In her free time, she loves hanging out with her husband and Black Lab. Her favorite activities include yoga, boxing, and reading biographies. So 111 is basically an online platform and Danny is going to tell you much more about it. But the reason why I wanted to have Danny on specifically is because 111 focuses on just that financial wellness and you actually are assigned a wealth coach as well. So I have a profile and I have absolutely been loving it. So Be sure to use my link in the show notes if you do want to check it out because they are offering some really great promos for if you sign up to get 111. But all of that being said, Danny and I chat about her her background. We talk about that wealth gap that she uncovered when she was working on Wall Street with super high net worth individuals and how it led her to founding 111 because she saw that so many people around her were super stressed about money and she just saw that, you know, the ultra wealthy were were really just not stressed at all and making tons of money every single day. Whereas, you know, us regular folk were, were really stressed out about money and she wanted to bring that education to people. We talk about what exactly financial wellness is and why it's trending right now in our society, what most people are missing when it comes to financial literacy. So I asked her her top three concepts that she would teach everybody when it comes to financial literacy, why it's super expensive expensive to be poor and really cheap to be rich. We talk about traditional budgeting and why a lot of those apps don't work and what makes 111 different. We also break down exactly, she actually calls it a spending plan versus a budget, which I really liked. So she breaks down exactly what your spending plan should be and how to figure out where where that goes and where all of your money is going each month. And she even includes, you know, big life goals and money mindset and things like that. And also, you know, she talks about how you can budget for all the fun things as well, such as like updating your wardrobe or date nights and fun things like that too. And then we also dive into common myths around finance and money that she debunks for us, which is really, really helpful. So before we dive into the episode, I want to give you my health coaching tip of the day. And this is going to be to spend some time, whether it's five minutes or 30 minutes, 
this week to look at your finances and create your goals around your finances. I think one of the biggest parts of financial wellness is actually just looking and seeing where you're at. And I know for so long, like I ignored these things because I didn't want to see it and it was scary. And I know that it is scary, but definitely spend some time to look at it. And if you want to use 111 to do that, it is such a great picture and it's a really, really effective app. And they actually have a desktop version as well that you can just see your big picture and see where you are, where you are and make a plan from there. So spend some time. Danny stresses in this episode a lot education. So even if it's being educated, getting a finance book, or maybe watching a YouTube, um, watching some of the videos on the 111 Instagram, whatever that is, definitely just spend some time on it because our financial wellness does attribute to our overall health and wellness. And it's a really important piece that we shouldn't be ignoring. So without further ado, please help me welcome Danny Pascarella to the Purely Podcast. Hi, Danny. How are you? Hi, doing so well, Alicia. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm so excited to have you on. This is actually the first episode that we're doing about finance and financial wellness. So I am super pumped for this story and for you to give everybody really good, valuable insights because I think that finance is something that's not talked about enough, especially amongst women, which is, I know, why you founded your amazing company. So to start off, I would love for you to tell a little bit about your story and your background. I know that you you used to be on Wall Street and now you're doing something, you know, same field in terms of the finance, but pretty different in terms of what you were doing on Wall Street. So I would love for you to just kind of talk about that in your background. Yeah, of course. And I guess, first of all, just, wow, I'm excited to be the first finance guest. This yeah. is really exciting and then an honor to, to do this. So, so my background, I mean, I grew up in a household where, you know, my mom was on her own at 16. And like was, you know, working hourly jobs to just put herself through school and just really survive. And she wound up being really successful in her life. So I'm sure like, as I'm sure you can imagine, being the child of that, there was a lot of financial lessons in my house growing up. Uh, So much so that I wound up loving it, wanting to help other people kind of do the same and really master their money. So I wound up actually going to Wall Street and managing money for the super rich. So like 25 million was the minimum to like billions of of dollars. And it was really like a a dream job to be, you know, you're in your 20s, you're, you know, managing money for the wealthiest of the wealthy. And it was really cool. But I took a look around at like people I grew up with, my friends that I went to school with, and everyone was really, really struggling with their finances and how to figure it out. And they were all extremely smart people, great careers. And it wasn't their fault. It was just that like society doesn't teach this stuff. You know, I think back to high school and college, I took like Greek mythology and like all these classes that I will like probably never use in real life, but like, you know, how to, you know, a credit score, a budget, like that never came up. So I wound up, you know, actually helping friends of friends uh, to friends and then their friends and, you know, getting coffees and, and helping people figure this out. And then I realized, hey, this is, you know, there's probably something here. This is probably something that a lot of people struggle with. And I found out after some research, that's actually the reality. You know, four out of five Americans are paycheck to paycheck and, and money is the number one cause of stress in our country like year after year. Yeah, which is crazy because I think that that's something that with my clients, I look at a circle of life and financial wellness is one piece of that circle of life. And we're constantly kind of using that to check in and it does really impact our overall health. So can you talk a little bit about what in your terms is financial wellness? What it, you know, what is it? Why is it trending? And also too, maybe how our financial wellness affects our overall health, like in your opinion. I know you mentioned stress, but I think that there's a lot more to do with that as well. Yeah, totally. So I love the the circle of the circle of life you called it. Yeah. I love that. So we call it here the wellness trifecta. And it's like we look at it like physical health, emotional health, and then you have your financial health. And you can't really be just a healthy whole person without all three of those together. Um, I think financial wellness, it's it's really trending now because I, I think money or really anything that's good for us, it's so easy to just let it kind of fall, you know, to the back burner because it's it's something hard doing harder things and pushing them to later is kind of how we're wired as people and life can get busy. Right. And I I think that just being, you know, 
on the heels of the pandemic, we've got time, we're reassessing our lives, we're thinking about how can I be a better me? And, you know, it's very natural that that money comes up as part of that conversation, because that's like the, like I said, if you were to walk down the street and ask, what's the number one thing that's stressing you out? And that, you know, stress is obviously bad. There's bad stress that's not good for us that makes our lives worse. And for most people, like money is the answer there. So imagine if by mastering money, you can just remove like the biggest cause of stress in your life. Like I would love to remove the biggest cause of stress in my life. That would be amazing. Um, So I think that's why it's trending now as people just really looked within um, and figured out like, you know, what do I need to do to be the best me? And it's because we have the luxury of a little more time for many of us because of just, you know, the world being shut down for so long. Yeah, that's true. We do resist the things the most that we know will make us feel our best. And I think a lot of times when it comes to finances, people just try to ignore it. At least I know that a lot of millennials, I mean, especially millennial women and not like making a generalization, but I think that in our society, men seem to know more about finances, about investing, about the stock market than women do. So can you maybe dive into what most women or people in general are missing when it comes to financial literacy? Like if there was three concepts that you could teach everybody, what would those three things be? Or, you know, or maybe just the basics of what you would, you know, shout from the rooftops if you could in terms of teaching people about money. Cause I think that it's something that's missing, especially amongst women. Yeah. So that's a fantastic question. So three things, I think the first is just take the time to invest in your financial education and just learn like the basics of what you need to do. Um, That's a big part of what we do at 111 is we have, it's called our kind of core curriculum and it's like two minute bite-sized videos every day. And like by the end you learn about money. So there are, you know, a lot of just kind of painless ways out there to figure it out. But I I think the, the big reason why you do that is like the reality is it's something we all have to face It's going to impact all of our big life decisions and it doesn't get easier if you wait. So by taking control right now, you're saving yourself. I know it's, it's hard to take action today. Um, but it's like, it's one of those things like going to the gym. Like once you do it, once you put on the sneakers and you're there, like you never regret going, do you? Yeah. No, <laughs> never. About, yeah, and learning about finance is the same way. It's like, oh, really? I don't want to do this. Like, there's so much stuff on Netflix right now. I could be watching or doing. Or, um, but the reality is, if you take the time now um, to do it, then it'll save you just so much, you know, stress and wondering if you're doing the right thing for the rest of your life. Um, so, first is learn. I'd say the second thing is just. It start investing as soon as you can. Um, that's one of the big problems with waiting is like time is on your side, right? There's this thing called compounding with investing where the earlier you start and like the more time you have to do it, the wealthier you'll be. Mm-hmm. So the big re- like if you talk to anyone who's older and, and we have like clients of all ages, everyone who's older, the second they get it, the first thing they say is, I wish I started like, 10, 20, 30, or however many years ago. So I'd say like the best time to start investing is yesterday, but we can't go back. So today is the best day and and just start. Even if you can only do a couple like dollars a month, just, you know, do that, start there and build over time. Yeah. And on that one, I'd love to ask you a little bit of a question too, for anybody that's wondering this, because I know it's something that I've wondered in the past. Would you recommend that people are investing while they have say like a student loan or credit card debt or any sort of debt? Like, would you, would you recommend that they're doing that simultaneously or is it kind of like not a one size fits all situation? It kind of depends on your financial situation. Yeah, so it's totally not one size fits all. Um, that that's a big thing. So I can give you the example if if you have a four hundred one k match at your job, like that's free money. Like a lot of places, you put in a dollar, they give you a free extra dollar. So mm-hmm. like that's something. It's you get an instant hundred percent return. So like take advantage of that all day. Um, you know, doubling your money instantly is like you're not going to find that in many places. Um, On the flip side, like, let's say you have student loans and like, yeah, you could be paying them off right now. But if they're federal, the interest rate you're paying on that is zero. So um, if you look at like throughout the pandemic, what zero percent student loans have costed and what uh, you could have made, like, you know, by investing during this time or even keeping your money in a savings account. Right. It's it's higher. The the return 
gotten for yourself is higher. So it's very much a case by case basis. And like, that's where we go back to number one, which is learn the basics and then you'll know what to do. And then you'll be like, yeah, I'm, I'm making the right decisions and I feel great. Yeah. Okay. So then what's the third thing that you would like third concept that you would want to want everybody to know? Third concept is like value-based spending, like by far. So I think a big thing that I see is like, we all go to work and we work so hard for the money we make and we get so busy that it's hard to like, and if you look at the dollars that are coming in, it's a lot. It's usually a lot for most of us, but it's so easy to spend mindlessly, especially today when like, you know, I go on Instagram, I'm like, oh, there's 10 things I want to buy. And, um, you know, if you do that, like what happens is you'll find, you'll wind up spending your money on, not on the things that make you the happiest or that you value the most, but the things that are just in front of you, like the advertisers that are paying the most or who's getting your dollars. So one of the big things we, you know, we really um, promote and, and really believe in at 111 is every single dollar that you earn should get you closer to your best self, the person you want to be. And if you take a look at your, you know, your credit card statement or your bank account at the end of the month, then you look at those transactions and you're not like, wow, I worked hard for that money and I'm living my best life then it's time to kind of rethink about the way you, you know, your spending plan. I, I don't like the word budget because it feels so restrictive. We like yeah. the word spending plan. Um, and I, I think just, yeah, reframing that narrative of it's not this restrictive budget and this kind of annoying thing I have to do. It's, wow, look at all the money I made this month. And now let me spend time picking, like, what are the most exciting things that I want to do with it? Um, and when you do that, then just the whole concept of not just money, but living your best life become a lot more reachable and intangible. Yeah. I like that shift of narrative and it's almost, it's, it's very similar. I'm seeing a lot of similarities between this sort of way of thinking as well as how I approach goals with my clients too. And when I'm looking back on goals, I'm saying, okay, well, these are my goals and these are my priorities. Is my time matching up with those goals and priorities, you know? So it's kind of like the same concept of, okay, here's the things that are really going to make me happy and bring me joy, allow me to live my best life. But then let's see, how am I spending my money? Is that matching up with how I want to spend my best life? So would you recommend with that like value-based spending, that's the, the extra, is that like your ancillary spending? Do you recommend a certain percentage that goes towards that? Like, okay, well, once you have checked off, you know, your rent, or I feel like sometimes I, the, the, older financial books that I have read have like, okay, well, this percent should go towards your, your house or this percent should go towards, you know, your, your bills or like whatever that might be. Do you have a certain percentage or is is that again, like kind of case by case? Yeah. So I, I, the 50, 30, 20 rule is like the big kind of percentage rule of thumb. And that says 50% of your money goes to your needs. Um, um, 30% will go towards just fun, whatever you want. And then 20% goes towards your goals. And they're really great for books because the thing about books is like, they really need to be like cookie cutter one size fits all. Cause the game with the book is let's get as many people as we can to buy this thing and read it. Yeah. Um, in real life, like we're all very unique people with different situations and goals. And, um, and so it, it really should be tailored to you as the individual. Um, so I, I'd say take, the, the big, you know, finance rules of thumbs that are out, are out there, but just know like personal finance is personal. It's not one size fits all and tailor it to you and, and what you need to do. Yeah. Going back to the second thing that you said about the investing and kind of what we were talking about with the debt. I once heard somebody say it's really expensive to be poor and it's really cheap to be rich. Can you speak on that a little bit and just explaining that to anybody who maybe that's a new concept of, you know, like you were talking about interest rates and things like that. I think that's something that's really important and something that really like checked a trick or turned a trigger on in my brain and when it comes to the financial literacy. Can you speak on that a little? Oh yeah. There are so many ways that applies and it, it's so, so, so true. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, interest rates are the first thing that come to mind, right? So, um, you know, near over a third of American households have just revolving credit card debt. And if you look at the interest rate on that, I mean, it is, you're paying thousands and thousands of dollars in interest, you know, every single, you know, every single year for a lot of people. So, and if you think about it, it's like, I'm going to work and I'm paying 
off stuff for, that the past me used. And I'm also paying my bank a ton of interest for things that I bought in the past. And like, it gets really expensive. I think the tough thing, like credit card debt is the big one. And once you're in, it's very, very hard to break that cycle statistically. You can, and our clients absolutely do every day. But, you know, you wind up in a situation where a big part of your monthly income is like paying your bank. Um, and then that's expensive. Um, and you're looking at interest rates. And I mean, we're seeing like 20% for a lot of, you know, a lot of cards. Whereas if you're wealthy, think about it instead of that, you know, those hundreds of dollars every month going towards interest for your credit card. Imagine if you're investing them and they're growing at like 10% a year for decades, you know, over time that becomes, you know, a million plus in, in dollars that you now have in your investments. But the person who didn't have money, like they just, you know, they're probably still in credit card debt and still paying off that interest. So that's like one example, but there are, you know, other ways, even things like insurance where like wealthy people have it, you know, if something like even something like pet insurance, right? If something happens and you, you know, you planned ahead and you have that, you're not paying a ton of money. It's a very manageable thing uh, yeah. because you made that, you know, that payment, you know, every single month to make sure you have it. But if you don't plan ahead and kind of think like a wealthy person and have that mentality, now you've got a bill for thousands of dollars um, that you didn't plan for and that, you know, probably is going to go on a credit card of some sort. So, um, yeah, that's a couple examples. But uh, the best thing and the easiest thing is to get on you know, the wealthy side of that and start thinking like a wealthy person and acting like it. And then, you know, eventually you'll, you'll be that if you, you know, you follow that path long enough. Yeah. Totally. It's kind of like that, um, that concept of like the millionaire next door. If you do, if it's like, you don't necessarily, and I think that, that touches on your point of, you know, starting early. Cause I think if you do start early, no, I mean, you can make like a modest, you know, it's like, it's not like you have to make millions of dollars a year to have a very comfy life. Right. As long as you're managing your money correctly. Would you agree with that? Compl could not agree more. And like, even the concept of millionaire, it's, it's so different now. Like the reality is if you're a millennial or you're a Gen Z, like if you don't become a millionaire, you cannot retire. No. Like the yeah. price tag. <laughs> yeah, like you have to be like, if you just plan on being a millionaire, you will get there or else you're going to be working forever. So just go. I, I think that's a game changer for, you know, for a lot of people when they realize that like, whoa, I have to get like a million dollars in the bank or I will be like working forever. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll kind of hopefully jumpstart you into, you know, doing more, more finance stuff. And that's why to your point, it's, it's important to do it now and, and not wait. Let's take a second to chat about Daily Harvest. If you're not familiar with Daily Harvest, it is my latest obsession. If you follow me over on Instagram, then you definitely know what it is because I cannot stop posting about them. I cannot stop enjoying Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest helps you stock your home with clean, delicious food that's delivered to your door, built on real fruits and vegetables, which is ready to enjoy in minutes. What's really cool is that all the food is frozen, so you don't have to worry about wasting anything. And what's awesome about that is that they work directly with the farmers to grow the best produce, harvest it at the right time, and freeze it within 24 hours at the source so that they lock in the amazing flavor and unmatched nutrition. I've found myself using and trying so many different new vegetables with the daily harvest meals. They're so convenient. Post COVID, I was feeling the cooking fatigue, but however, my wallet doesn't love if I'm eating out for every meal. So these have really come in handy when I'm not feeling like cooking, but I still want a delicious home cooked meal. And I can just easily add in, you know, protein if Nick needs something because they are gluten free, they're keto, they're paleo, they are dairy free and plant based. So, but even if you're not plant based, like I mentioned, you can add in a protein like an egg or chicken or steak or fish, whatever you want to do to up that. But there is definitely a good source of plant based protein in there. And as I mentioned too, the ingredients are absolutely amazing. They are all free of refined sugars, gluten fillers, preservatives, or really anything artificial. They're all ingredients that you know and love. And of course, the convenience of it, it's fast, it's easy. You get to choose the items online, then they're delivered to your door and you can just pop them out whenever you need them or want to make them. So that being said, if you want to try out Daily Harvest for yourself, you can use code PurelyPope. P-U-R-E-L-Y-P-O-P-E -E for $25 off your first box of Daily Harvest. And of course, I will give a link in the show notes for you to check it out. With that, let's get back to the show. 
So how would you suggest somebody, I think you used a different word than budget. You said like a spending plan, right? Spending plan, yeah. Yeah, Okay. Okay. So how would you suggest somebody attack their spending plan? And maybe you can go over how 111 breaks it down. Because I know when I was logging on to my portal, I saw like emergency fund, investing, spending, like debt management, life goals, like all these different areas. So can you kind of recommend how you, you how you would recommend somebody and how 111 recommends that people attack their spending plan to be wealthy and financially literate and financial and and really attain that financial wellness? Yeah, that's a that's a, a, a awesome question. So I think the first thing is just understand how much is coming in, and after you know after taxes and all of that, what's the amount that hits your checking account every month? Um, that's step one. Step two is understand like what are your recurring bills every month. So that's like your rent or your mortgage. That's like student loans. You know, once they come back, whatever the thing, Netflix, the things you have to pay for every month, um, list them out, and then you know subtract what you have coming in minus what absolutely is going out every month and look at what you have left and when, and so subtract um, one from the other, what people typically see do when they see that number of what's left is where does all this go? Like, this is actually like pretty substantial number and I have no idea what's happening to it uh, each month. Anyway. So once you have that list of the fixed costs, um, make sure everything there is like something you feel okay and good about. Like we've had clients be like, my rent is insanely high. I'm working remotely. I don't need to be in New York City. I could go move to, you know, you know, Austin, Texas, or like another place I've always wanted to live. And, you know, Great I can cut my- <laughs> Yes, exactly. From so all I can cut cities. my- Totally. And I can cost, cut my cost of living like substantially. So make sure you're cool. Like these, these expenses are hitting every month or like you might see subscriptions that you like don't even use. You're like, what is that streaming service? I haven't like logged in and, you know, in months. So cut all this stuff, like kind of, you know, cut all the stuff that you're not actually using or that you don't feel good about and see what that end, like what I have left looks like. Um, from there, um, look at your goals. So those goals are like the things that are the most important to you. And we don't want to leave them to chance. And I think what most people do is like they spend throughout the month, they pay bills and they're like, I'll save whatever's left. And then there is nothing left because mm-hmm. we're just, you know, it, it, it's not how it works out. Um, so save for your goals up front. Like the second you get paid, auto transfer to like whatever account you have for those goals. And they can be like the serious finance goals, like retirement or, um, you know, emergency fund. And they could also be like more fun goals. Like right now I'm, I'm revamping my wardrobe. Like I'm like, oh, the world's opening back up. And I look in my closet and I'm like, I'm a very different person now. And I need like a fully, you know, I need to refresh this. So that's actually one of my goals. I have like a spending kind of, you know, wardrobe refresh budget every month that I'm like, you know, gradually rebuilding this. So they can be fun goals too, but the idea is like, make sure you're spending upfront and allocating money to the things that matter. I even have a date night, a like kind of goal fund too, because I'm like, okay, I want to make sure I'm like going out and like doing those things. And, you know, um, so yeah, so just make sure you're funding what's important to you. And then what's left after you take care of your goals is like, that's your, you know, regular, your money for the rest of the month to do what you want, live your best life, have fun. And I like to break it down into weekly numbers and daily numbers, just because that's more like you see this big lump sum and you're like, I don't know what to do. But if you break it down into like a daily or like a weekly number, then it's it's a lot more, you know, it's easier to understand like what that means and what you can do with it. Um, yeah. And then just back up that one. That was really helpful. Thank you for breaking it down that way. But something else that I would love for you to dive into is because I really like how when I'm on my 111 portal, I see everything and you have a wealth coach and you know, there's also two, I think traditional budgeting apps, they just really haven't worked for me in the past. I feel like they don't capture everything. So can you talk a little bit about why, in your opinion, traditional budgeting apps haven't worked in the past and how 111 is really different and really touching on that wealth coach? Because I thought that was really cool because as myself, I'm a health coach and I think that I see the the difference and the impact that I can make in people's lives when we're working one-on-one together. And that's an aspect that I've never seen on a financial platform before and especially like a budgeting platform before. So can you dive into that and just really what sets one 
want to love and apart and maybe just giving everybody too, because I don't think we've done it yet, an overview of exactly what 111 is and what they could get from it. Absolutely. So I, I think the first thing I love that you're, you know, you're a health coach, so you totally get this. Anytime as humans, we're trying to do something hard, we are statistically way more likely to be successful if we have a coach or a support system or somebody that, you know, somebody to help us um, get, get to that, that next level. So that's true of, you know, of health. That's true of financial health. Um, they're, they're both the, the same. And, you know, what I think uh, with traditional budgeting apps is budgeting, oh, sorry, traditional budgeting apps, uh, they miss that completely. Like the reason why we struggle with things that are hard, it's, you know, it's we need that support system and that accountability. So at 111, we do have a wealth coach for every single one of our members. And I think the key things there are just like, you know, it, it's psychological, right? The reason why we struggle with anything, it's almost always our mental barriers. So the wealth coach is there to help you create that budget, help you talk through your priorities, because sometimes like you need to talk things out to manage setbacks is the, the biggest thing. You know, you can either, um, com you know, commit, slip, commit or commit, slip and you're done and you're, you know, you're out. So um, and then you quit. So I, I think that's like such a key piece to success. And there have been studies about this. So we have like a whole studies, scientific studies library at 111. And they actually looked at my, like my fitness pal, which is like very similar to traditional budgeting app, right? It's like you're entering your calories or you're looking at your spending and you're tracking this over time. And, and what they found is that alone no difference whether you're doing that or nothing because it's you know statistically there's no weight loss or with finance there's no actual like improvement in your finances and it's because as people like we need more if it were easy we would have done it five years ago but we need that coach and support um and i, I think a big flaw with a lot of these kind of self-service apps is no accountability, but also like they kind of set you up to fail, right? Like you either are, you know, if you have any kind of mess up and you're even slightly over, you know, in dollars and calories or whatever, the app just kind of yells at you. It turns red. It says you're doing poorly. And it's like, if I'm alone and I don't have a coach and I can open this thing that makes me feel bad and like I'm failing because I just made like one mistake or, you know, something unexpected happened and I don't want to open that app again. But if there's a friendly, you know, if there's a friendly coach like you, that's like, hey, it's OK. Life happens. Success is not linear. It's a very different conversation. Totally. So, um, yeah, that's, I think that's the big difference for, for, for most people is just, you know, support and positivity, um, you know, and then accountability. Um, 111, though, um, to, to, to switch gears. Uh, so we are a financial wellness app. And the way I think about us is we give you everything you need to be successful with money um, and to feel great and confident and in control. Uh, what that means is like, yes, you get a wealth coach. So that's your dedicated person. You can chat with them in the app. You can set up a video call if you need to like have a little financial therapy and talk things out. But they're a person that's there that's dedicated to you being successful. And, and that's key. Like anytime I try to do something hard, I know I need somebody on my team to, to help me get there. Mm -hmm. um, you also get um, custom financial plans. So um, this coach is going to like crunch the numbers. So you'll sync all of your accounts to our portal or the app, and then they're actually going to look at everything you've got, your student loans, your cash, any investments you might have, your 401k, and they're going to basically break down like, hey, here's how you're doing right now. Um, here are your goals that we've talked about before. And like, here's what you need to change to make your goals a reality. And then from there, they're going to break it down into smaller micro goals. Because I, I think a lot of times we have the mentality of like, I want to do it all today. And habit change is very rarely like that. I'm sure you see this all the time. Yeah, I was going to – I'm smiling because yeah. I'm like, this is so similar yeah. and like very linear to how I coach too. It's like breaking everything in, down into tiny, tiny, tiny little goals, but then they stack up over time and make a really big difference. Yeah, totally. It's, it's like I want to pay off, you know – ten thousand dollars in credit card debt is the same as like i want to lose 10 pounds like right now and like yeah. if you don't do it right away or you have a setback you feel really bad but if you break it down to smaller like i'm gonna eat healthy this week i'm gonna go to the gym three times i'm gonna you know set aside fifty dollars from this week's paycheck into like smaller more tangible things then it becomes much more doable and you get into like this cycle of winning, which is that's the coolest part. I think like it, it takes about a little over two months to build a habit. So our goal is like, let's get you to do these small things. And this is we use tons of psychology to, in, you know, 
the psychologists helped us build our entire platform. But, um, you know, how do we create these break your big goals into smaller bite-sized micro goals and then get you to keep like consistently hitting them. And then, you know, after a while it becomes effortless and there's, there are so many parallels to like, you know, to nutrition and fitness. It's, it's kind of crazy. Like I remember I, I completely dropped the ball during the pandemic with fitness and going back to working out was like the biggest struggle. Like I was like that girl that's like, I can't get out of bed. Uh, I don't want to do it. And then you go and you never feel bad about it. But now I'm like, I feel weird if I don't go to the gym for a day. I feel like something's off. It reverses because you're so yep. used to it. It's a habit. So money's the same thing. So you're going to go through this period of like, it's tough. Your coach is going to help you. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, this is natural and this is easy. And this is just what I do because like I am a wealthy person and this is how I roll. And that's what we want. Um, to happen with our, our coaches. So you get the coach, the game plan, the micro goals and accountability. Um, and then you also have our app. So like you can rate your purchases to make sure they're in line with your values in our app. Uh, so we have a whole education series where it's like a bite size, um, two minute videos every day. And after 10 weeks, you've had learned like everything you should have learned about money in school, but probably didn't. Um, so it's the full suite of tools really gives you like everything you should need to just feel like, yep, I've got this. It's habits. I'm good. And, you know, let me go focus on the other more fun areas of my life. Like the things that I'm you know, passionate about or, you know, my loved ones or whatnot. Yeah. I love that. And I love the different apro approach and having the coach. Cause I think it does, it allows people to be set up for success instead of failure, like you were mentioning. And you touched on something too, that I would love for you to expand upon a little bit where it's like when somebody messes up and they're like, okay, well, I'm just not going to look at it. And I think I kind of touched on this earlier as well in terms of people kind of ignoring the finances a lot. And I know that like I was guilty of this in my early 20s when I knew nothing about it. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, like credit card. I didn't really realize how a credit card worked, you know? And then I would be like, oh, yep, that balance is just going up and going up. And I would just kind of ignore it, right? So, and because I think also, too, it's scary at first when you don't know something, it is scary. So can you give any sort of advice to somebody that's maybe in that position that's like, finances right now, even just like talking about it, they're like, oh, like just kind of cringe up a little bit. What would your advice be to them? And also too, you mentioned those bite-sized pieces. So would it be maybe, okay, set aside some time each month or each week, or what would your advice be for kind of dipping your toe into it for somebody that's really scared to get into it? So dipping your toe if you're scared, I, I think the easiest first step is just educating yourself, right? Because it's not you can learn the basics, whether that's like our educational curriculum, maybe you pick up a book that like kind of goes through the basics. So you, you know, you watch some, you know, something online, right? But knowledge is really like, it, it's, it is power. And it gives you the ability to feel more confident that you can have that change. And that's a big part of why we do education too. Because if you feel like, like, sure, our coaches could do everything for you and like do to do a ton of the heavy lifting. But like then you wouldn't learn and you wouldn't feel confident. And if we removed your coach, you would be like, I don't know what to do. And like the goal should be to be empowered about this so you can use these skills for the rest of your life. So education is like a very good way to feel great. Every single minute you spend learning something new, you should be so proud of yourself for just like, you know, doing something to better yourself in a world where it's so easy to, you know, turn on Instagram or Netflix or whatever. So um, that's just, it's already a very positive thing. And then you don't really have to look within just yet. Like it's very easy to just like consume the education, understand like, oh, investing is important. I get why without having to really like take action on your own. And, and what that new knowledge does is, you know, from a psychology standpoint, it sets the stage for change because change when you have no new information is hard. It kind of means we have to acknowledge that like we messed up or, you know, we did something wrong or like, or maybe, you know, it, it, it's hard. But when you get new information, now it's, oh, wow, the narrative is there. The narr we're, I'm all about narratives. Like the narrative yeah. is, changes everything for success outcomes. So now, oh, I, I read this book on investing or I watched some videos online about investing and I get it. And now I'm so awesome for watching that video and I'm going to take action now and like do something about it. So it becomes like this positive experience of I'm step by step getting to where I need to be versus like I'm you know, I feel overwhelmed. So I'd say my big advice to step back is like, 
Start with education and start small. Pick one thing. What's the one thing that's like keeping you up at night or that you really are interested in and want to do? And start with that bite size and set a goal to do like five minutes a day, whatever it is. Um, yeah. Just a couple of minutes, whether that's looking at your purchases, whether that's like watching a video, but just like commit to a little bit and you will be, you know, um, one of the big things we say just internally with our company is like that 1% better every day. And in a year you're, you know, 37 times better. So yeah. take those little steps um, and, you know, you'll be in a really good spot um, sooner than you think. That's awesome. That's great advice. And as kind of a wrapping up too, I would love for you to just dive into quickly maybe some common myths about finance or money that you don't believe or that you don't find to be true. Like I think one that maybe isn't a myth to you or whatever, but I think a narrative especially that's told to millennials all the time because we are like the renting generation is that renting is a waste of money. You're throwing your money away. You should only buy or so, you know what I mean? Like myths like that, or maybe you, you do believe in that. So I would love for you to kind of touch on those. Maybe there's some myths out there that you don't believe or that you would wish people could, that you could debunk a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So the rent one is huge. I, I think renting is, there's pros and cons for both sides, right? Renting gives you flexibility. Like you, the second you're a homeowner, like you are locked in and typically in, in most markets, like it's not a good financial decision unless you plan on staying for like at least five to seven years. So at a certain, you know, if depending on where you are in your life, like if you're like, you know, what if you're single and like you meet the love of your life and like they live somewhere else and you're a homeowner, like you or you get your dream job offer so, and it's somewhere else and like you've got these, you know, you're so invested in this house and like you're going to lose money if you sell because you just bought it. So I think the big thing is renting is flexibility. It's I think even the pandemic, I was, I'm a homeowner now. I was a renter during the pandemic. I got out the second I was like, New York City is not going to be looking good for a while. And it was a quick decision. I made it in a weekend and I was gone. Whereas now, like I'm a home, I'm in the verbs, but like, I'm like, I, you know, I, I can't leave in a weekend that I'm yeah. looking at months to the house on the market. So that's like, that's a big thing. I think on the flip side, like, yeah, you're locking in your cost of living as long as you stay in that home. So like there are a lot of financial benefits to owning the number one, um, you know, source of wealth for most Americans, if you look at their net worth is actually their home. So there are really good benefits to it, but I would say like, don't everyone's different and like you'll you'll know when you're ready and there's a time but um yeah total total myth I, there are so many situations where i'm like keep renting like you, this is what makes sense for your life right now um yeah. yeah so other other big money myths i think like i don't know the, the money is the root of all evil gets like <laughs> such a bad rap too. i feel like i feel like that's one i don't know if that's as much millennial but definitely like you know my my parents generation would say that all the time yeah um i having managed money for like the wealthiest of the wealthy and everyone in between, it amplifies what's already there. So if you're not a nice person, like, you know, having more money is going to make you like 10, you know, hundred X that if you're a really nice person, like think of all the things that you can do, right? Like you can, you know, help others. You can donate to charity. You can do all sorts of things. And I think that's, that's actually a really big issue that we see with, um, with some clients that feel like, I'm guilty if I'm successful financially. Like there are so many other people who, you know, like it's almost like they push the money away because they, they feel like it's, you know, it's something they shouldn't have or that they, they, you know, they don't deserve other people need it more. And my message to you is like, you can't help others until your cup is full. Like Mm -hmm. you need to make sure that you're okay. You have everything that you need And then you can worry about helping your family, your community, and like do all of those things. But like, there's nothing wrong with making sure that you're okay first. And it's like the same way on a plane. They're like, put your mask on before you help the person next to you. Like same deal with money. So don't, no shame in, you know, making sure you're doing okay. I love that you brought that up because I think shifting our mindset around money and like you said, you're really big on shifting the narratives and that's how I am as well. I think there's just a lot of parallels between, you know, the wealth coaching and the health coaching and I love it. And that actually brings me to one of my ending questions, which is all about self-love because I think with the filling up your cup first, that is such an important mm-hmm. philosophy that I teach my clients for for health yeah. and overall wellness. So I would love to know what self-love means to you. 
I love that question, <laughs> first of all. But yeah, I mean, self-love, that's such a big concept. It's, it's almost hard to even put it into words, but you know, appreciating yourself and feeling proud of yourself for like all the things that you do every single day. And like, sometimes that's going to be, you know, a big accomplishment. Sometimes it's going to be like, Hey, I just, I just made it through the day. And like, you know, I, I'm okay. And I'm being me and that's enough. So just really ultimately comes down to feeling not only are you enough, but you're more than enough, um, you know, to, and you know, just, yeah. Um, but again, so hard, so hard to articulate, but that's, yeah, believing that you're, you're more than enough and you're worthy of, you know, all the great things in the world that can happen to you. I love that. And then the last question is, what do you love most about yourself? Oh, wow. Um, I, um, the thing that I love the most about myself, I, I like to, I have a couple, I guess a couple things. If I had to limit it to one, I think it's that I'm just very passionate about what I do in a way where like I can have an idea. Even this company was an idea of like, oh, I could help more people. And like, I'm so passionate that I will overcome like any obstacles or roadblocks to, to make that happen. And that's, you know, in business, that's for the people in my life that I care about. So I think like the ability that I can take passion and fuel it to allow me to do like really great things for, you know, for the people around me is it's, it's, uh, you know, a rare skill. I think it's a kind of rare skill set. So that's something I'm really proud of. And then I think always also just like trying to be a good person as, as, as much as I can, which I feel like that's the answer. Everybody, you know, probably because I'm a kind, nice person. So. No, I love that. Um, it's I, important. I think, it is yeah. important. <laughs> It's very important. So I, that would be my answer, but I feel like that's kind of like a boring answer. So <laughs> no boring yeah, answers. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that question. That's fantastic. Oh, good. I'm glad. So where can everybody find you? Where can everybody find 111? Tell them all the things of how they can figure it out. We'll leave a link in the show notes too for, for everybody to find it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, you can doubt, you can go to 111.co. So, uh, spelled out. So O N E E L E V E N dot C O. Um, and then you can, we've got all kinds of like tips and articles on there. Um, and we've also got, you can sign up um, directly on our website. Uh, we have apps in the app store and Google play. And then also Instagram, um, has been, um, a, an area that we're really focused on lately. So our handle is at get 111, all spelled out and you know we'd love to to see you on there and we do all kinds of giveaways and, and things like that all the time so and lots of money tips there as well if you're looking for a way to kind of dip the toe in, in into some uh, personal finance knowledge perfect well thank you so much for coming on this was very enlightening and educational i appreciate it oh good thank you so much for for having me this has been really fun Okay, everybody, I hope that you enjoyed that episode of the Purely Podcast. I so appreciate you listening and I hope that it was enlightening to you and that you will take the steps to become more financially well because as I was mentioning, it is so, so important. So if you want to check out 111, you can find that link in the show notes so that you can check out that app and just see your overall picture, get yourself a wealth coach because it would be absolutely amazing. I know you guys would love it. I am loving the platform so much. And as always, if you enjoyed this episode of the show, if you enjoyed any episodes of the show and you are a frequent listener, I would so, so appreciate it if you could rate, review, and subscribe to the show wherever you are listening or watching because as a reminder, these are also posted on YouTube. So you can subscribe to the YouTube as well and also follow along over on Instagram at the Purely Podcast and at Purely Pope for my personal page. And if you do that, you will automatically be entered for a chance to win a health coaching session with me, a one hour session with me, as well as a copy of my five-star rated ebook, Leading with Love. So without further ado, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you again for being here and I will see you next Thursday. Bye now.